Hello again, everybody. Thank you for joining us all day today. It has been an impactful day uh, embodying success for your businesses. I am elated to uh, introduce the next speaker, Aaron Stokes, who is the founder of ShopFix Academy. Um, he is him and his team are mentoring and guiding shops to success. Um, and if you haven't been to one of their events, they are very motivational, uh, moving, and you can really see the results within the community that they have created. So um, this session is going to be on to go multi-shop or not. And Erin, I uh, will make sure to keep the Q&A um, at a bay, but we'll if there's a lot of Q&A at the end, I will pose them to you. Guys, if we do not get them answered during this session, I will send them to Aaron and he or a member of his team will reach out to you guys. Um, also, don't forget that we are giving away, thanks to ShopFix, two Shop Hackers conference tickets, which is, uh, I may say this wrong, August 2nd and 3rd, I think are the dates. Yeah. Um, and so we would love to see you guys there. These tickets are valued at $9.99, so almost $1,000 worth. You always bring incredible content. So I'm going to hand this over to you, Aaron. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. So um, thanks to Amber and the uh, Amplify team for bringing us on here. And I'm going to try to bring you guys as much value as possible. So I want to talk to you about, um, just I guess I should call it uh, to multi-shop or not to multi-shop, but uh, do you want to grow? Now uh, there's two ways to grow, right? We can either go more locations or we could just say, you know what, we're not going to add more locations. Instead, what we're going to do is we're just going to grow the single store that we have. Um, there's n Neither is wrong, but there is some that cater to certain personalities easier than others. And um, you can fix that, uh, change it or, uh, you, know, do, you know, do whatever works for you. But again, it depends on your family, your situation, et cetera. So let's just hit the highlights first. So. If you're going to go in the multi-location range, I would highly encourage you, and I'm not sure what how this software works, but I hope you guys can zoom in and, and see this as I'm writing. But if you're going to go to the multi-location range and you're going to say, you know what, I want to have three locations. Well, somebody who operates with three locations is going to totally operate differently than somebody who operates with five locations. Okay. And the same with 10, et cetera. So if I was just to give you the basics right now and walk you through just a couple high level things right from the get go, if you want to grow and go multi-location, your entire process must get simpler. It can't get more complicated. It actually has to go down, not up. So um, I currently own 10 locations. I've got nine open myself. Of course, we got ShopFix Academy training shop owners all across the country. And we want to make sure that we help people climb the ladder, get to the next level, grow, become who they want to become. Everybody who's uh, maybe invested in an auto repair shop who has never been in the industry or somebody who's possibly an ex-mechanic working at a dealer now has opened up their own shop and everybody in between. I started as a, uh, a grease monkey, shade tree mechanic in my backyard, living in a single wide trailer in an old tobacco barn with gravel floors and plywood on the ground. That's how I started. Everybody needs to understand, though, to get more you have to get simpler. So in my locations right now, there's something I'm always battling. It's called splinters. So as your tree grows, and your tree is your enterprise, right? As that tree's growing, it's got its branches, kind of this, and it's like an evergreen tree. We can't have it with a branch shooting off growing this way. We can't do that. That can't happen. And the reason we can't do that is because Complexity fails, simplicity scales, right? So we have to cut all of this off right at the base. I was in one of my stores and a couple of them were doing things differently with some paperwork. And I said, when do we do, you know, change this up? And he said, well, you know, some of our older locations that are more experienced doesn't need this. Some of our new locations do. And I said, hold on. <clears throat> From here going forward, we've got to come up with a decision. It can't be random. Either we're all on it or we're all off of it. We just opened two locations in the last 60 days. And so for me to not have chaos in the company and be able to handle that, that means that this cannot be allowed. There has to be one way we do it over and over and over. 
So if you're Chick-fil-A and you're growing and you're starting to get Chick-fil-A off the ground and it's starting to take off, everything you do is a certain way and you can't break away from that. Eventually, maybe you can change once the brand is built, but you can't break away from that. So I want to encourage everybody here. You have to establish what your tree is going to look like. So everybody here is different, but everybody has a desired goal for their business. And I'm going to encourage you. You've got to pick out what your tree is going to look like. So if this is your tree, this is it. And that is no deviating from it. That's it. And if we're going to change, we all talk about it. We decide as a team and we roll it out and we test it in one location first. Now, if you grow one giant store, the easy part is you can change more on a dime. Now, don't get me wrong. The giant store becomes like a Titanic, if you will. And you have to be very, very careful to keep it on the straight and narrow. But as you grow and as you go in a new direction, you need to understand that splinters are not new directions. Splinters are accidental. Splinters are one manager doing something, one service advisor, one little change. You can't have some of your stores doing walk around videos to protect you from getting scratched and dents and some stores not doing it. You can't have one store doing paper, one store doing digital. You can't have one store that has a keyboard in the office and the other store has the keyboard out in the shop. You got to be able to have them the same so your staff can go to each location and train and be able to take that back to the other store. Now, a couple quick things. I don't care what business it is. Trust issues are going to start to come into play if you want to go multi-location. Now, if you say, hey, Aaron, I'm a control freak. I'm trying to work on it. I'm trying to let go. But I, I just don't know that I can get there. I'm just going to tell you now, just grow one large location. And that may mean that the store you have now isn't the right store for that. Now, one large location requires several things. So you got multi-location over here. If you have one, if you say, Aaron, I want to go really, really big. And we look at your store and your store is a three bay shop on the main drag. And you want to have a huge one, right? This is your pedestrian door, your little window. This is your shop. As you're trying to decide how you're going to grow your company and you're just trying to decide what direction you're going to go in, if you want to go from here to a large shop, but this is on half an acre, right? If you're on half an acre. We have to pause and ask ourselves what we want to do with that. We're going to be like, all right, you know, I, I just don't know. I don't know that that's going to work. I mean, if you want to do five, six, seven hundred thousand a month, and you're like, I don't want to go multi-location, then you have to start looking at properties that are more like two acres, maybe four acres. Because to do that kind of volume, you're going to have 150 cars on the property at all time. I have to have somewhere to put the cars. You also have to have this is your shop. They're all just a basic shop. But this shop, if we have just one door in, one door out, it's a big warehouse. You're going to have to have anywhere from 10 to 17 bays. The, the odd number is going to be the alignment rack. So 10 to 16 two posts to get to that type of level, right? So if you want a super shop, that's fine. You can go get a super shop. We've got probably the largest in the country, several extremely large, doing six to uh, 900,000 a month. But our shops are all five day a week shops. None of, and none of them work past six o'clock. They're all, you know, 7 to 6 or uh, 7.30 to 5.30. In fact, the, probably the biggest in the country I know of right now is a 7.30 to 5.30, Monday through Friday, and uh, doing 900K in the top months. And so when you stop and you think about this, if you want to pull this off, you have to have massive amount of parking for employees and for customers. So this is a huge deal. You just got to do size. So it may come down to a decision where you got to say, you know what? I need to move from this to this. So if you decide, I want to grow, Aaron, but... I need more cash to pull it off, et cetera. Then my encouragement to you would be to potentially sell the location you currently have, relocate to something that's across town outside of a non-compete or in a different town, or sell the real estate and it's for something else. You're going to make it a CrossFit gym, whatever. It doesn't matter. Take everything and get to a larger property. You are capped. Now, don't get me wrong. Can you do uh, out of a three-bay center $2 million a year? Yes, we've got clients doing that. We had one guy who hit over... 200 grand a couple times with only two bays. So yes, you can do massive numbers, but if you want a super shop, I mean, 500,000 and above, you just got to have room. We got to start there. So don't even waste time remodeling this. What's the quickest way to get from this to this? If you're only going to have one store. Now you're going to go multi-location. It's all about the model. The model, the way we fix cars has to be the same 
every single time. So let's think through this. If you want to build things the exact same every single time and you are trying to grow your company, but people want to go in a different direction, you have to realize that if you have a simple plan, you've got it figured out here. If you cannot delegate and let go, you're not going to be able to grow. You have to be able to delegate. You have to be able to let it go and it flies away. And so if you can delegate this to somebody and let it go and let them handle it, this project is going to go from you, right, over to them. And it's going to land in their lap. And now they're going to own that project. It's going to become theirs. But to delegate, a lot of people say, oh, man, that's easy. It's easier said than done. I also think that this is a huge issue at the corporate level. So if you're going to go to this um, level and you're going to take it um, to a place you've never been, you can't do kind of your backwoods accounting. So the first thing you got to do is get your books very tight. Everything's reconciled. Everything is down to the penny is counted. No rounding differences. Your day ends are exact. Everything. So books are very tight. And I mean very. From there. You're going to have to have a bookkeeper that's going to charge a fee to everybody else to do their books. So whether you use an outsider or you have an internal person, you got to figure that out. Now, that has to be done the right way. What I would encourage most of you to do is if you have a shop here, shop one, this is an LLC, that shop one or an S Corp, most of you are an LLC or an S Corp. I'll put S Corp. Depends on what state you're in. And you got shop two and you got shop three. I'm going to encourage you to put inside of the first shop your corporate office, and you're going to go in and reclass your QuickBooks. To reclass QuickBooks. I'll explain that in just a second. We need our books tight. So if we're going to get our books tight, we have to have this set up correctly. So that means if we've got one, two, three LLCs, we need to think forward and think about where we're going with things. So let's just... Pause in this for a second. If you're planning, let me switch colors here. We'll do green. If you're planning on having uh, three locations, you have liability. So we need an S Corp or we need an LLC. However, if all three locations are in the same state, some people would say put all three in one LLC or one, else, uh, one S Corp. If you said, Aaron, I'm going to open nine locations, I would tell you, how about three? If you said, I'm going to open up six, I'd tell you, how about three? Now, let me walk you through what I'm thinking here. We have, let's call it three LLCs. If you're going to use an S Corp, that's fine. They're very similar. So you've got store one, store two, store three. The way you would go about this is you would open your first store. Your, for, your first store is then going to get the loan for the equipment, the property, et cetera, and guarantee all your notes for the second store. You will start a new LLC with this thing guaranteeing everything for this one. In fact, this will probably even have to buy the equipment for this one. You'll load it into this one. Then when you go to open up your next store, I would probably tell you to come back and put it inside of store one. Then when you go to open up your uh, fourth store, I would tell you to go back and put it in store two. And then when you go to open up your fifth store, we put it in store three. When you go to open your sixth store, we put that also in store three, inside that LLC. Now, why are we doing it this way? If you said, Aaron, I'm going to only open two stores, I might tell you just to keep them both in the same LLC because we're thinking about liability, but we're balancing liability with complexity. Books got to be tight. If we get too complex, books can't be tight. So if I'm trying to think through this and figure out how I'm going to do it, in store one, I'm going to put my corporate team. So... If corporate's going to take up this much of the PL, this over here is a store. So this is corporate. So over here is my shop, right? And I'm going to circle this so it doesn't get confused with everything else. So that is all my shop. On QuickBooks, all you do is go up to uh, the options tab, click on that, and you're going to see a class section. You're going to click on, click on class, and then your bookkeeper can help you set this up, and they can rename a section for your corporate. And you can put your bookkeeper in there, et cetera. Now, what will happen is 
this store will pay a corporate fee. And let's just say the corporate fee is 5K a month. The store is going to pay a corporate fee back to this one right here. And it's going to come into this LLC, but get classes income on the corporate side. It's a separate class. Then store three or LLC three. Both of those stores are going to be paying five grand a month. Let's just pretend there's right now only one store in each for easy, easy math. So we have 10 grand a month coming in. Now, as that five in 10 grand a month, you know, five plus five is 10. How does this store pay for this one? This store is going to have to move it to the balance sheet, right? And then it's going to have to move it back over here to end up hitting here. Now, it doesn't really matter. We don't even care if it's hitting here or not. And just for, it, it, honestly, it's for multiple reasons. Whenever you're setting this up and you have, let's just say, 100 grand, 100 grand, 100 grand, all three shops are doing 100,000 a month. I would actually want them doing much more than that, but easy math. If we're taking 5K from each and hitting it on their overhead, and that's coming over here to the corporate side of the PL on store one, on LLC one, your bank at some point for financials is going to ask for consolidated financials. When they ask for consolidated financials, you're going to remove the class. Your bookkeeper and everything's just going to dump into this. So any fees that would be coming into this from here or anything else are just going to cancel and wash out, right? All of these would combine in one total number. It would be 300 grand a month. And let's say you made only 10 grand a store, it'd be 30 grand a month net. I'd hope you make a lot more than that, but you get the math because it's being combined. If you go and you set up some separate financial entity, an LLC over here, and all these corporate fees are dumping into that, you are going to confuse your bankers. Your bankers are going to be like, what's this over here? And you're going to say, oh, that's just my corporate LLC. That's where my bookkeepers pay. It's where I'm paid, et cetera, et cetera. And you can move all your profits into it. But now you've just added another layer of complexity, which I have done, and then I undid. And then on top of that, your bankers will never understand that it does not have real revenue. It will confuse the crap out of them, that it doesn't. So I highly recommend you do not do that and that you put your corporate office inside of your first location. Always put the corporate office inside the first location. It's your oldest LLC, your oldest S Corp. It's the most established, will have the most credit with the banks, et cetera, for growth. Again, if you want to go multi-location, now if you said, Aaron, I want to own 10 locations. All right, that's fine if you want to own 10. I still would not go one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, I wouldn't do five, six LLCs and then go back and add a second to each one. At some point, we have to balance the risk. All right. So if we're going to balance the risk, I need you to pause and ask yourself, all right, could I do three in this one, three in this one, maybe four in the last one. Maybe I'll do four in the first one. Maybe I'll put them in each one based on the county they're in because they'll pay different rates of sales tax sometimes per county. There's a lot of complication when it comes to this, but you want to make sure that you have this set up correctly. It makes sense and that people are going to want to get behind it. Now, you may go, why would people not want to get behind it? Well, if it gets really hard to grow, really hard to finance, really hard to get banks to understand, they're not going to want to get behind you. They're going to feel like you don't know what you're talking about, and it's just not going to make sense to them. We want this set up so the books are really, really tight. And everything flows. Now, what's going to happen when you go multi-location is you're going to have to jump on top of garnishments. Like you're going to have people that uh, child support for kids, bankruptcies, um, all kinds of stuff. You know, it, it just new employees. You're going to find out after the fact they owe all this money and you got to help them. It's a pain in the butt. When you go multi-location, this just multiplies it skyrocket, uh, skyrockets off the charts. You're going to be all the time pulling MVRs, motor vehicle reports, to know if they can even drive for you. A lot of you here may or may not know this, but when it comes to the insurance side of things, everybody here needs to be careful with any employee you hire with the DUI. Some of you, your garage keepers on some of you right now will cover them as crazy as it sounds. On Again, talk to your insurance agent, but will cover them sometimes whenever they're driving a particular car that um, the client doesn't even have insurance on because garage keepers is so far out there. Even with a DUI, it'll cover them sometimes. I could not believe this. I had an insurance agent once tell me, yeah, garage keeper has broad covering for um, test drives. But when you start having six, seven, eight, nine locations, all of a sudden, every hour, I've got seven cars being test driven. What's the route that we decided on? When you have one store, it's just kind of a given. When you have seven, eight, 10, 20, all of a sudden, there's a route that's decided on, and our insurance is going to give us rates, which becomes a huge number based on those routes. Also, a lot of you are going to get your service advisors coded as uh, technicians. A lot of you have heard all the conversations. What is it? Uh, 
8810, whatever it is, office versus clerical versus management, et cetera. You got to basically tell them your advisors never go back there. It's crazy, but when you become multi location, the microscope gets on you. Like they're all over. You may go, Aaron, this sounds like a pain. I want to stay single store. I get it. I get it. Now, you got garnishments. You got to be checking on MVRs. You're going to have benefits for your employees. 401, uh, 401ks. Are you a 1% match? Are you a 5% match? Are you a 10% match? Everybody's different. How? 10%. There ain't no 10%, but um, find out how you want to match, what you want to do. What are your paid holidays? What are your systems for it? Some of you with one store, you close down for a week between Christmas and New Year's. Guess what? When you go multi-location, that doesn't happen anymore. You're a big time company. You are a professional organization. Can't just close down for a week. You got to have half the people off this week, half of them off the next week, and the store's open the whole time. You got to think through these processes and how you're going to schedule this stuff. Everything down to employee client relations. Now, employee client relations is refunds, making people happy, and also touching base with your uh, your employees, giving them, uh, I don't know, pay, buying for lunch, doing lunch and learns, et cetera. Everybody here has got a different situation that's going to require them to figure out how to handle their employees. And I will tell you this. If you have employees that are not turning in employee client, or I'm, I'm sorry, employee parts purchases every 60 to 90 days and they're technicians, then somebody's stealing from you. Because the technician is not taking his car down to Jiffy Lube to get the oil changed. He's doing it in your shop right now, squirting oil off out of that oil drum. So you want to make sure you're honest with your technician, tell him what he can or cannot have, and that you also hold them accountable. And you know what? Your honest technicians want you to do this because they don't like it when other technicians just take from the shop. Because they know the shop is everybody's bread and butter. So this list goes on and on and on. Everything down to now you may not do cash drawer logs. Now you got to do cash drawer logs. Every store has a cash drawer. We count it down to the penny. We know what's in it. If you're the kind of owner that walks up, put your hands in there after somebody gives you five grand, pull it out, pick three grand, put it in your pocket in front of your employees. Guess what's going to happen? They're going to start stealing. You've made it look okay. Now they're going to think it's okay. I want to make sure that everybody is on top of this at all times. Now, when you get all this stuff starting to get dialed in, we haven't even gotten to the accounting. The accounting starts to become a beast. You could outsource it. You can outsource payroll. You can do it all in-house. doesn't matter. It's whatever works for you. If you're growing faster, I'm going to tell you to put it all in-house. If you're growing pretty steady and you're not opening up more than one store every couple of years, then you could totally do it outside of the company and have no issues. So it's, again, pick your poison. It's what works for you and your family. One of you, you, you or your spouse might be really good at accounting. And so maybe you run it internally. That's fine. When you get to a certain level, you're going to get sick of it because it's going to become a beast. It's become very, very stressful. You'll find you're scheduling vacations around payroll. That's not fun. Now, again, I'm not diving in. I've only got 45 minutes and only got another 20, 25 now. I can't get into all the details on the corporate side, but it is absolutely massive. Massive. I cannot stress. Um, don't even like it. If you went from one store to two stores, your first bookkeeper in the first store can kind of cover payroll for both and the basics. But I mean, shop owners all the time in one store and they don't even have everybody as W-2. Half of them are 1099. You can't do that. If you are in charge and you are the boss, then they are a W-2. A 1099 is somebody who sets their own time frame, their own pay, et cetera. And if they're not doing it and you are, we got to be legal schmiegel on this. You got to get our, uh, our, our ducks in a row before we grow. Otherwise, you just put a big target on your back, and that's not fun. You got in this to have fun, I hope. I want to make sure that you continue to do so. So that being said, I also want to make sure that you understand speed. So we'll stop on the corporate side for a little bit. On the speed side, everybody here is going to have problems. My stores have problems. Your stores have problems. Everybody does. The question is how fast you can tackle those problems. So the problem happens here. And when you have one location, from noon to one o'clock, you can take one hour to think about it and fix it, right? But what happens if I have another problem, and then another problem, and then another problem? Well, as this magnifies, I end up with another issue here on this hour. And if I did not resolve the first one, now I'm carrying two. And I have another issue jump and land on me on that hour. Before you know it, Three issues in three hours. 
Well, by the time I get to four, five, six, I got six uh, six issues. If something pops up every hour, I will tell you, gone are the days if you go multi-location where you can think about a problem all day and then come back and solve it. If you don't think that you're going to enjoy jumping on something and knocking it out quickly and making an instant decision, do not do this. Because you're going to have to make a lot of very, very quick decisions because you just can't handle the weight of it all. you got to get it decided and get it off your plate. Get it decided, get it off your plate. And that's going to require you being able to study the details, listening to the people that know what they're talking about, and resolving the problem quickly. Otherwise, you'll think about it for a day, and in one day when you have three locations, you have three times the problems. And before you know it, they cripple you. And if these problems cripple you, you're not going to understand what to do. Um, it's going to stress you out and potentially can break some people. It's not fun. Now, um, I want to talk about your advisors. And we're going to talk about techs. We're going to talk about managers. And over here. You want to talk about value, or we'll call it just valuation. All right, we'll come back to that. So for advisors, all service advisors are going to have themselves set up in a way where they can make money and make themselves win. Hopefully, as a byproduct, you win too. So they make money for themselves. The shop makes money. You make money. It's a circle of life. It works out. It's great. The problem is... A service advisor, when they dive in and they start working on their stuff to sell a job, if they don't know their stuff and they're dependent on software, they can't shoot from the hip, they're not going to be able to function clearly. When I walk into a store and I see a car being towed out, typically that car is being towed out because that advisor was not able to think on their feet and save that ticket. And when you have multiple locations, you're not there. You're not able to see that Sally over here is not able to answer this question with confidence so that customer's having her, towed, her car towed out. You're not able to see that Bill over here got rude on the phone and did whatever, and they're getting their car towed out. When you had one store, you were there all the time. You controlled that stuff. Whether you realize it or not, your culture kept everybody in line. So if you understand how it works with advisors, you're going to start to see that advisors must be trained. Advisors, when you're there with them, they function with you. They function differently. Their functionality is all based on you being around, right? So if I work in your building with you and you never just come hang out with me, but you indirectly hang out with me because you're always there. Well, then when you get three locations, now all of a sudden you have to on purpose come hang out with me. You have to on purpose directly connect with each person one by one by one by one. Oh my gosh, that's exhausting, right? And so what I need you to understand is that part of what's holding your company together is the culture around you. Culture is the hidden guardrails, the hidden ones that keep them on the straight and narrow. So if we look at how they function right now, how, the, how well they sell, et cetera, it's based on your influence. The moment you go pull an advisor, a different location, et cetera, take a technician, do a different location. All of a sudden you weaken that store's team. They're not going to perform as well. So now we have to have this formal training program to increase their functionality. Why? Because they are all going to fall to their highest level of preparation. So what does that mean? If you've gotten them to where they can sell five grand a day and a six thousand dollar day shows up, guess what? They're going to screw up and fall to their back at a five grand day, meaning they're going to mess up every time they pass that line and drop back down. They're going to mess up, pass that line, drop back down. So you've got to see that everybody's going to fall to the highest level of their preparation. So if they're prepared for a five k day, if they're prepared for a twenty k day, that's what they're going to fall to. They might be able to handle a twenty two thousand dollar day. If everybody's there and it goes super smooth, but the moment they get stressed out, they fall. So we have to provide training so their functionality increases. And why are we doing this? Because we want to see increased participation in our system. Your technicians. Your technicians, you train them on that system. You train them on how we do things here. This is how we do inspections. This is how we do repairs. This is how we do quality checks, et cetera. 
Well, as you do the same thing with them, this group here is going to have to continue to get trained, just like the advisors. Typically, technicians are trained easier than advisors because most offices are incredibly different from store to store, but usually most repairs are very similar. And the only thing that's different is the way they inter, uh, interact with the office, but not much more than that. Where you have to really stay on top of it here is it's very easy for you to have a guy who just is bouncing around, trying to get a raise, asking for more money at each place he goes. And as he continues to ask for more money to each place he goes, he ends up landing somewhere and saying, oh man, I'm going to get my raise here. And so he goes in and he tries to get this raise and he says, I want to do this, 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 and this. And when he goes to do it and he puts it out there to get that raise, he's actually stretching and calling himself an A-tech when he's really a B-tech. And so he's going to get himself from $28 an hour to $38 an hour or $48 an hour or $58 an hour. And then you find out, then you got to cut them loose. And then a couple shops do that. And the guy's always trying to get back to that past level. We need to provide training to hold them where they are and to help them grow, right? The problem is if we don't have a good training program and we don't start seeing what good technicians look like inside of our organization, when an average person shows up, we're not going to spot them because we're not doing it enough. You've got to be trained. You've got to know what a good tech looks like. You got to understand how to interview a great tech. And you have to become a master of recruiting. Recruiting is everything when it comes to technicians. It's very important with advisors, but it's literally everything on the technician side. Now, for managers, your managers, their number one job from here going forward is to maintain culture. Maintain culture. What is culture again? It is the hidden guardrails or hidden rules. We want, we want our team to say to everybody else, that's not how we do it around here. This is how we do it. And if your team continues to say, this is how we're going to do it, or this is how we're going to do it, we don't want that. We want them to say, this is what we're going to do in this situation because here at this company, we do it this way. And if you have employees that don't understand that this is how we do it at our company, they're going to do what they want. We need to get that, and the manager is the one that enforces that. Now, the valuation side of things is huge. If you have one store and you get one store to 5 million in sales, which is what? A little over 400,000 a month. So it's a big store, what I would call um, a super shop. If you get 5 million in sales, it's, I'll put sales here. And let's do 1 million net. You go to sell it. If this is a single store outfit, this, um, and I hate saying this. We'll just use this for both, actually. Single here. We'll do multi here. I'm not going to worry about writing it down. I don't want to make the paper any more busy. But let's just say that um, on the single, it's a $5 million store with a $1 million net. Or if it's a multi-location, it's five stores doing $100,000 and those $100,000 a month, which is $1.2 a year. And those five stores are making two hundred grand net profit each which comes up to 1 million net. So we're just making up average numbers here. So if you went to sell this store in 22, you could get some ridiculous valuations, like 21 and 22 with a heyday and selling auto repair shop. I mean, it really started tanking in 23, but people were seeing massive numbers that are not accurate. Sorry, I just stepped right out of the camera. And so these numbers that people were seeing, these multiples that weren't honestly able to be kept up with, it finally started to, Honestly, crash. I'm having people call me like crazy wanting to sell stores and I, I'm having to sift through it all because there's so much, but they still want 21 and 22 pricing. They heard their buddy sold for this. They want that. Well, that doesn't exist anymore. So I'm going to tell you roughly what you're looking at. Right now, if you got a single juggernaut store that's netting a million dollars right now, you're probably looking at a three to four X today. You could have got five or six X, seven X maybe just two years ago. It does not exist anymore. But if you're over here at five stores netting 200,000 each, guys, this right here is anywhere from a five to an eight X out of the door, sometimes even more. It's crazy just because it's multi. Now why? Because these groups that are looking at buying auto repair shops, which I'm not a fan of, I'm hoping everybody just keeps them in the family and passes them on to their kids and sells them to other people that are small operators. 
I'm a big fan of this because I want to see quality shops out there. Everything that gets bought up by these PE groups seems to go down in service and the end consumer ends up having a bad experience. And they talk bad about our industry. And it's just awful. So the multi-location five to uh, five to eight X, why are they getting more? They're getting more because the valuation is coming from a point of, there's no way we can run a store this big. Where do we find a manager that can handle that? The average good leader can handle seven people underneath them, maybe eight. To find somebody who can lead a store, 25 is a needle in a haystack. It's just the truth. To get a, a decent leader that can handle 10, 12 people in a building. And you may think you've seen a decent leader. You may think you're a decent leader. But until you've seen somebody who's pulled off massive numbers, I don't know that you have. Now, maybe you have a friend who has, and you're like, man, that dude's got some strong leadership. Or maybe he doesn't. Maybe his number two has strong leadership. It doesn't matter. The point is that you have to understand to do this at these types of levels is hard. It is. Now, it's hard for different reasons. A single store for this kind of level means you got to find a really kick-butt manager and a kick-butt foreman, like top-notch leaders. Over here, you have to have just decent leaders. But now we have to find a way to collect them and bring them all together. Right? So my encouragement to you right now is to wrap your head around which one of these is best for you. Now, you may go, I'm going to leave it to my kids. I got enough money. Doesn't matter. Well, then uh, neither of these matter as much as what is your skill set. I've had some people tell me they're never going to go multi. They're always going to still uh, be single. And then all of a sudden they open up a second store. What happened? Well, I just got a wild hair and I saw my friend do it. I'm like, oh my gosh, just because your friend did it doesn't mean that's how it works. But how much time do I got? Okay. I got seven more minutes. Just because your friend did it, it doesn't mean that's how you're supposed to do it. So think through this process. Now I will say, you're going to have to have on a single store an amazing GM to run this store. Over here on a multi location unit, you're going to have to have an amazing DM, district manager. So the amazing district manager or the amazing general manager, you got to pick what, which one you're going to go after. I will tell you. The multi-location, I try to write, uh, raise somebody up from within for culture purposes. It may not be possible if your dreams are bigger than the current people you have. You may have to hire from outside. I don't know all of your situations, so that's something to think through. But this is a massive decision. You could go three years giving somebody a chance and it doesn't work. Now, I will tell you this. The higher the position in your company, the shorter the leash. One more time. The higher the position in your company, the shorter the leash. What does that mean? You're going to have an amazing uh, general manager where here you only have to have average general ma uh, managers in each store. If you're going to have an amazing one, they better not be messing up. I mean, they got to be on it, guys. Like if they have screw ups, they're tiny. But if you decide you got a mission, you got a little store, you're going to go sell it to get, get, you know, get yourself a big store and it's an old warehouse and you're going to turn it into a massive shop. You get this big dream. You're going to land this person ASAP. Then personality tests are going to be a big part of this. You got to know your strengths, their strengths, to be able to get the right combination to make this happen. Don't do it off your gut. Over here on the multi side, you want to make sure on the multi side that you have an amazing district manager. And I mean that. What does an amazing district manager look like? You've got to spot them. And then if they start messing up and uh, taking your culture down a path you don't want them to, you got to reel that back immediately and stop. You've got to get the right person. Again, short lease. As, as soon as you start seeing mistakes, be willing to cut them loose and you jump in and handle it. Now, that's why I like to bring them up from within because I've, I've sanded off all those rough edges. Now, I will tell you, once you get, if you decide to go the multi-rat and you really decide to grow and get larger, there's going to be another position you're going to have to hire. Them. This next position going to be a recruiter. The number one thing that's allowed me to grow past five locations is somebody full-time on staff who all they do is recruit for me. And that person has to match my um, core values and get the right person on board for me. So that means whether it's techs, writers, managers, yes guys, um, parts managers, about all the physicians in my company, whatever. They have to be getting people that flow with me. Now, they may have for the technician position or even for the writers, they're going to have maybe a foreman 
or they're going to have a manager sitting in and helping make that call that knows technical stuff, quizzing them on the fly. But this recruiter knows how to read people. And the beautiful thing about a recruiter is they go around to all of your locations. They're almost like a chaplain, if you will. There's somebody that has power without authority. Power without authority is somebody who has the power to um, fix your paycheck, fix a raise, fix where your, your uh, commission was wrong, et cetera. But they don't have the authority to fire you, right? So they tell that person things. They won't tell their manager. They won't even tell me. So I highly encourage that you dig deep and you eventually, when you get past that three, four, five location, I'd really say past four or five stores, four big stores or five small stores, you need to be hiring a recruiter. And you may say, I don't want to weigh down my corporate office. I'm going to tell you, it's just what you got to do. Now, at some point, I've only got a minute here left. One of you, I say one, means somebody on your team has to be in charge of marketing. And if you're going to go multi-location, marketing is huge. Now, if you're going to go single store, marketing starts to become somewhat redundant and gets easy. If you're going to go multi-location, it's always an issue. You're always trying to dial in marketing. You get, you'll put out a bunch of marketing material for this store and this store gets busy instead. And you're like, oh my gosh. And what ends up happening is the wrong store gets busy at the wrong time. I want you to really focus in on getting the right store busy. And that means you have to understand how marketing works. That means whether it's Facebook ads, that means uh, Google AdWords, uh, radio, TV, spotlight cable. You can't do normal TV in, in most cities. Um, and radio, you can only do typically in towns of a couple million or less, unless you've already got a big chain that you can afford to do more. And then the big one, direct mail. You have to understand the behind the scenes. Doesn't mean you got to do it, but you do need to understand it, be able to read um, uh, penetration reports, et cetera. Know a good one from a bad one. Marketing is huge. Um, I'm just about out of time. This last topic I want to hit real quick is going to be on brand awareness. You have to make the decision, am I going to do multiple brands? I mean, you're gonna buy a store, leave the same name on it, or am I gonna do a single brand? Now being in auto repair right now, none of you need to be paying to go out and uh, build a brand for yourself. Brand for us at our size needs to be a byproduct of extremely healthy marketing. Coca-Cola, um, you know, Sam's Club, Walmart, Target, they do, branding they can afford it we cannot we can't afford just to have a separate budget for brand to be top of awareness or um, a top of mind and have strong awareness you need to be thinking through this which route there are benefits to both customer if you have multi-brands customer gets ticked off at one shop they go i'm going down to so-and-so and they end up going down the street to another shop which i have two shops a mile and a half apart with two different names for that purpose now some of you may go but then my marketing material i have to Make sure I don't overlap, et cetera. You're right. You don't want to overlap and water down each brand. You have a single brand, you can just blanket a whole area for marketing. It's a little bit easier. Does it save money? No. People used to tell me it saved money. I can tell you from personal experience, it does not save any money to have one brand. It just doesn't. However, the multi-brand does help you get out of a pinch a couple of times. From a valuation standpoint, selling it for more. One single brand will always sell more, uh, say for, sell for a higher dollar amount than multi-brands. The other problem, if you have a single brand, Pricing between stores. Your stores are going to have different pricing, different advisors. So customers are going to shop breaks at one store, call another store, and then all of a sudden this store is cheaper than this one. They get ticked off and get upset and want to complain. There's a million different ways it can go wrong. But if you decide which way you're going to go, you can build a system and a process around it. And with that, I am out of time. I was able to hit all the high points. Most of them. I have a few left, but we're good. You can. You have You have five minutes. So if you want to hit those. Well, you do you have any questions? You no any... questions yet. Just really okay. good information. Great feedback. So I'll give you okay. five more minutes. Yep. Yeah. I'll, I've, I could go five more hours. Not a problem. <laughs> so the big thing I want to make sure that everybody understands when you go multi-location, if you decide to go down this route and you decide to go with a single brand or a multi-brand, um, multi-brand, like I said, can get you out of a pinch when you have an upset customer, you know, et cetera. The problem is it doesn't carry the same level of panache when you go to a bank where they can say, oh, I've seen your stores everywhere. You, there is a certain amount of clout you want for acquiring more real estate um, when you're dealing with an attorney, any of that stuff. You want to make sure that you start to get known. Why? Because fame is the most efficient business model. One more time, fame is the most efficient business model. So whether it's your daughter, your puppy dog, your uh, husband, your wife, yourself, 
you know, your parents, your grandma, I don't care who, your little baby, somebody's on the front of every flyer next to your logo on your website. They're on your Google page. They're on Facebook. They're, they're everywhere. And you want to make sure that you continue to build that brand so that it continues to take off and go in a certain direction. Now, obviously, most of my stuff is a single brand. I have some multi-brand going on, but I would say the lion's share of my stuff here is in a single brand. People in the industry will find out that you're multi-branded, meaning the parts guy will find out, um, a competitor will find out, et cetera. But your average soccer mom, soccer dad, they're not going to have a clue. So don't get hung up about that. Don't worry if somebody said, we actually had a guy went and post a review. This shop's uh, been bought by so-and-so. Um, you know, they're crooks. They're going to blah, 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 blah. They're going to rip you off. Don't go here. And we just pointed it to Google and Google had it removed. You're, you're going to have some of that backlash. So you have to think through what is my brand's reputation, not the reviews. Because reviews, if you really are honest, are somewhat bought off. Everybody listening to this webinar has had a negative review, called the customer, asked what they could do to fix it. Customer says, oh, I, I, I want this. Even though we both know you were right, the customer was wrong, but the customer has you over a barrel. So you give them their money back in the brakes because they're squeaking. Yet you told them to do, you know, pads, rotors, et cetera. And they didn't want to do it all. They only wanted to do pads on old rotors. And you told them it was going to squeak. It's still squeaking. They want all their money back. Or they charge back your credit card, et cetera. You have to go into this knowing that I have to protect this brand, but that customer is still going to leave with a bad taste in their mouth. Maybe they won't tell as many people, but they're going to. So, the brand protection when you go to a single brand is massive. You're going to write small checks here, right? This is going to be a constant issue writing small checks. The single brand, guys, like it, I had a car burned to the ground um, two years ago. They sent me a photo of this car that burned to the ground, a picture of the whole family in front of the beach, and then say that it's our fault and we tried to kill our family. Literally put that in the letter. And they are coming after me. Why? Because there's a bigger target on my back because it's a single brand with multiple locations. If I've been one location, they wouldn't have done that. How do I know? Because my single store with one name on it, I never get any issues with it. I only get my issues with the big, my bigger brand who gives even better service. So when a customer feels like they can get something, my point, they're going to. I just got another one the other day. Like we are constantly having that and it's 300,000 miles declines everything, leaves, the car burns to the ground, and they say, well, y'all must have done something to it, and they want to sue us. I mean, I mean, I'm being general here. I mean, but I've had it with alternators, water pumps, radiators. You guys have all had it. And so you have to understand that when you get to a single level, you will write more checks to protect it. Where at this level, a lot of it, you don't worry about it because the customers don't flip out as much. Now, a single brand that's also spread out across the country more. Stores are an hour apart, so consumers don't recognize all the different locations. You're also not going to have as big of an issue. But if they're compact in one town and they know your brand and you're more famous, you're going to have to fight it off more. Again, pick your poison. It's your choice. But this is something that I've been shocked. A lot of people were surprised by. They're like, Aaron, the moment I changed this store, the complaints went through the roof. And I'm like, you don't understand. That's because your customer thought it was a mom and pop store that couldn't do anything. The moment they felt like it was some level of corporate, which is what they're going to think when you have multiple stores, you know, it's not it's still mom and pop. They're going to think that they can get something out of you. So there has to be some protection around that. You have to understand that going in and just not get emotional, not get your feelings hurt and be prepared and have it built into your budget to grow your company and be able to write refund checks if you got to, because customers will manipulate. All right, guys. You are always on time. I really appreciate that. Uh, no questions, uh, just overall really good feedback, very informative, very educational. So thank you, Aaron, for joining us. Guys, just as a reminder, I know we've been in six hours of training. We started at 10 a.m. Eastern today. So it's been a long day, but really uh, wonderful feedback um, thus far. Don't forget that at the in after party, um, Shop Picks Academy is giving away two tickets to their Shop Hackers Conference valued at $999 each. That will be August 2nd through the 3rd, um, one of the largest industry events out there. So do make sure that you join. If you're not the winner, um, you can reach out to us. We'd love to help you get there. 
Um, at the other part of the after party, we will be uh, announcing our big leap competition winners. Um, this was something that was new this year. This project set out to celebrate the success of AutoLeap's customers and provide the opportunity to showcase their shop's journey. Um, they created their videos themselves. And so we're really excited to announce the winners of the $10,000 trip voucher and the second and third place vouchers. So uh, make sure to stay tuned for that and bring your uh, tissues. Aaron, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Everything that Absolutely. you guys continue to do, we appreciate the support and Guys, just a note, this is going to be live for 90 days. The system will still be open. So if you missed something, you can come back and watch it on demand. So Aaron, how can they reach out to you? You know, uh, Facebook's typically the easiest. You look me up on Facebook, hit me there. And uh, guys, you can join our free Shop Hackers Facebook group. Just posted probably three or four shop tours in there uh, of my own shops just the other day, remodels and uh, ac new acquisitions, et cetera. So you can go check that out. It's got a lot of free value. And then, uh, yeah, our Shop Hackers Conference, which will be August 2nd and 3rd, right here in beautiful Nashville, Tennessee. So awesome. uh, love to have you guys come out and check it out. It'll be fun. All the information is also at their booth in the exhibit hall. So we will see you guys soon. Thank you so much, guys. Have a wonderful day. Cheers. Appreciate it. Thanks, Amber.